if you ask me what are the two principles I have in business and life is make friends and have fun. And it's, that's all it is. I'm just making friends with people. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely more interested in you and I want to get to know you and I don't care what you do. I don't care if you're the president of the, a major corporation or you're um, a lifeguard at the, local, at, the, at the local beach or you're a teacher or you're a doctor. Or you're, it doesn't matter because I don't care what you do. I care about you, the person. And when you make that, cat- that, that big shift mentally and you start looking at people as people and who cares what they do, you're going to start building relationships and you're going to create brand ambassadors and champions in the world. Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Hello there, Jeff Lerner here with another episode of Millionaire Secrets. Always excited to be here with you guys, this amazing audience out there that's just growing like a weed, uh, the good kind of weed, we'll say. And um, <laughs> today I'm joined by Mr. Jeff Finster. He's the founder and CEO of Everbowl, which is uh, one of the, I don't know if it's one of the fastest growing, it's definitely one of the hottest, most high profile talked about uh, fast, casual, quick serve restaurants in the country. I'm excited to dig into more about that with Jeff. Uh, he worked in corporate America for a while. Um, like so many people I interviewed, decided that wasn't what he was cut out for. Originally wanted to be a sports agent. I'm excited to hear about that uh, and also the pivot away from that. And so many great things. Jeff's a brilliant entrepreneur and we're grateful to have him on Millionaire Secrets. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm a big fan of you in the show. And so it's an honor to be here. And obviously, um, Lo- love your first name. I, I, it yeah. feels like, it feels like home. So, yeah. Yeah. um, yes, thank you. Just a couple just talking, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, great, man. So yeah, I, uh, and I actually have some, some experience in fast, ca- fast, casual, uh, franchise ownership that I'll, I'll be interested to get a different perspective from you. Cause frankly, mine was terrible, but, um, <laughs> You're doing a lot of things right that um, I didn't see that company doing right. So I'm, I, I really applaud what you're doing. And, and from the research that I've done, it seems like you've got an amazing thing. But um, let's, if we could kind of start at the beginning. You went to law school, I understand, yeah. and you wanted to be a sports agent. Yeah, I was one of those kids that I had no idea what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a professional athlete. I knew that. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't blessed with uh, all the tools necessary to achieve that dream. Um, and so the idea of doing anything for the rest of my life was very scary. And, um, I went to university of Arizona for undergrad and I, and I boxed and then I graduated very young. I was 21 when I, I found out I was graduating my, my third year. So I had no idea really what to do other than, um, a good family friend of mine, my mentor growing up, you know, he was getting into more of the sports agency world. And I felt like sports agency was a great opportunity for me to, stay as close and connected to the professional sports world as I could with skills that I possessed. And so it seemed like the natural place to go. So uh, when I was graduating, I actually applied to law school and enlisted in the United States Marine Corps on the same day. Um, And I told the Marines that if I get into law school, I'm going to go to law school. And that was part of my um, enlistment. So they knew because I wasn't sure if I was going to get in being 21 and applying late. And um, I did. I got into a law school in Miami and um, did my first year there and then transferred to San Diego and finished up after my first year. Once I was in and proved my, my merit, was able to transfer and graduated with a plan to go be a sports agent. Yeah. And that sounds awesome. I, I actually have a friend who kind of did the same thing, got a marketing, didn't go to law school, but got a marketing degree and ended up going to work for a, a big sports agent in Memphis. And um, so I have a little bit of, and he was a really good friend of mine. I have a little bit of insight into that world, but I'm, I'm curious, I don't want to make assumptions. What what steered you ultimately away from that? My, my youngest was born and, and I really wanted to make sure I was going to be a present parent and just didn't see myself wanting to be on the 
dog and pony show of running around the world representing athletes when I was going to have a little baby at home. And I knew I'd want to spend more time with her. So um, I graduated law school without any clue what the hell I was going to do. And um, I just had six figures in law school loans and, uh, and a baby and a, and a fiance. And so that was, that was the pivot. It was really just kind of one of those moments where you have a kid and you look at the kid and you're like, I'd rather be with her. Yeah, I, uh, I can relate to that. I, I had a, a little girl in summer 2016. And within, I'd say within a year of that, I, at the time I had a digital agency that was trying to pull me into the office on a regular basis. And Within two years, I had sold the agency pretty much <laughs> because I wanted that same uh, dad flexibility. So I, I totally get it. Um, and I will say your instincts were good. My buddy who, who ran marketing for that big agent in Memphis, um, he, he traveled probably 200 plus days a year and had a really hectic, I would say, non-family friendly life style and ultimately got out of that business for much the same reason. So yeah. Um, good on you, man. Sounds sounds like, and obviously it's worked out. So you went to, if I understand, went to work for a payroll company. Yeah. So a good friend of mine was actually this a sales trainer at ADP, the payroll company. Yeah, yeah. And so when I when I graduated, you know, I was kind of like looking for opportunities. I didn't want to be a lawyer, even though I had a law degree, because um, I, the thought of actually practicing law just is like nails on a chalkboard for me. Just all that legal research and time, just it just isn't who I am. Yeah. Um, and so I really didn't know what I was going to do. And she said, well, why don't you get a, I can get you an interview at ADP. You, you're pretty good in sales. You, you have some sales background with your high school and college jobs and in training. Why don't you come? So I said, okay, you know what? I'll do that for now. And it'll start paying my bills and I'll just kind of see where the world takes me. And so I got a job selling payroll services at ADP. Yeah. Um, and I remember because after my interview, they, they, asked me to come back and I had to meet with their area VP who represented all of California. And she said, look, we, we get a lot of college graduates. We don't get a lot of people with law school degrees applying to sell payroll here. Um, and they wanted to understand more like why. And I gave them the same, I explained it to them. I said, I, I really don't know what I'm going to be doing, but I have this degree. And, and so I started there. And fortunately, my first six months there, I was very successful. Um, I was only there for six months. And in my first six months, I made President's Club, uh, first, first to do that in the country number one sales rep in the country, made a boatload of money and um, really grew really quickly. And I said, Hey, this is great. You know, maybe this is the life I was golfing three days a week, selling payroll services, seeing my kid making a lot of money, um, not stuck in an office all day. So it was a whole bunch of wins everywhere. And I was right. like telling my fiance, I'm like, this is great. We're going to make half a million dollars a year. And all I got to do is work 15 hours a week. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, it was a dream. Um, and so I went to my boss in January because we had just bought a house and I was paying another installment on the wedding and, and all this stuff. And I went to my boss in January because I had earned a $17,000 pay increase. And I went and said, listen, I'd like to get my $17,000. Um, and they kind of explained to me that it was an annual bonus. I had to wait to the end of the fiscal year, which wasn't until July or June. I'd get it in July. Um, and that's the way it works. And I just wasn't comfortable with that answer. I said, wait, 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 I achieved my goals, pay me my money and I'll keep working. Like, I don't, it's not a season. This isn't a sport. Like we, we were, we, we played 12 months a year here. So um, the only reason it's not getting it tomorrow is because you haven't hit the button that says, give it to them tomorrow. Um, and they said, Jeff, this is the way the big companies work. This is the kind of yet to conform to our process. It is yours. It will be yours. We love what you're doing, but no. And then I felt like a prisoner and I threatened to quit if they didn't give it to me thinking they wouldn't let Jeff Fenster walk out the door. Um, I was wrong. They said, there's the door. If you want to leave called my bluff. So I went home that night and I told my fiance, I feel like I'm in prison and I can't see myself staying here. So I'd like to quit the job, uh, move you and, and our daughter into my parents' house and start my own payroll company just because F them, let's go attack them. I know how to sell this stuff. I'll go take all my clients back right. and I'll go compete with ADP. And my ego obviously was driving that decision. Um, and she was supportive. And so literally moved out of my mom and or moved out of my house, moved in with my mom and dad in, in February of 2008 and started my own payroll company out of my mom's kitchen with a friend. And that was my foray out of corporate America and into entrepreneurship or back then, uh, that was before entrepreneurship was a word and sexy. We were called business owners. Right. And I was a, and I was a small business owner uh, for the first time and no clue what I was doing. And here I am 14 years later. Yeah. So, okay. So, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty uh, rich story from my point of view. 
a couple things jump out at me. First of all, I mean, ADP is a big company. I'm guessing several thousand sales reps distributed yeah. across the About country. 20, yeah, I mean, I was only, tens of thousands of employees, I'm sure. Yeah, I was in the small business. So zero to 50 employees or one to 50 employees, yeah. size companies. And there was about 2,600 of us okay. um, around the country in that division. And that, you were, that's, where I, that's where I was. When I say number one, it was in my division. Right. So you were number one out of 2,600 in your very first year. Yes. So why don't you talk a little more about, let's not just gloss over that. I mean, that's like basically saying like, I mean, one out of 2,600, that's probably the percentage of, you know, little, good little league players that at least end up making the, the AAA minors, maybe the majors. Like, that's a very small statistical increment for you to be number one out of 2,600, especially out of the gate. What, uh, what do you attribute that to? So uh, my mentorship and how I had built myself. So, I, you know, keep in mind, the average age of a ADP sales rep in that division is probably 24 four to 26 years old. So they're young adults, um, not a lot of seasoned experience there. And I had spent my high school and college aged years learning instead of earning most of the time. So I always had an internship. Um, I had a mentor, David Meltzer, who let me come and work yeah, with yeah. him at many of his companies. We grew up together. Um, and I got exposed to a style of selling called solution-based selling early on. Um, I was a telemarketer in high school, so I had cut my teeth telemarketing. Um, I was an outside sales rep in, in college selling T1 lines. So I got experience sitting down with business owners and going through a sales process. So I came in pretty seasoned. But really, if you want to know the true, honest, secret answer, and I get asked this question a lot, I outworked everybody. Yeah. Um, ADP is such a smart company. Like I'd like to tell you I'm special and extraordinary, but really I'm an ordinary dude who just did the extra stuff and it made extraordinary results. ADP had a, a motto, 55 and two, 50 calls, uh, 50 calls a week will set your five appointments. You get five appointments, you close two business, two deals, you close two deals. That's a hundred deals a year. Uh, and a hundred, yeah, hundred deals a year and you'll make presidents club. And that was their model. It, it was like yeah. spelled out for you. Truth is most people made 20 calls a day, set two and a half appointments a week and closed maybe one. Right. Um, and they wondered why they didn't get the results. And so once I got my talk track, once I got the cadence and I understood how to be successful, I really applied that and doubled it. I said, well, I can make a hundred calls a week and I'll set 10 appointments and I'll close four deals a week. So I started doing that, but then I threw lighter fluid on that because I leveraged my relationship capital. And I went to all of the people that I had been exposed to who were, who had, who had interned with and had built and established these relationships and paid my dues, so to speak, and asked for favors. And I went to Dave and I said, Dave, I'm selling payroll business services to one to 50 size employee size companies. Do you mind connecting me with your friends who own uh, businesses with under 50 employees? And he wrote this beautiful email for me and got me a bunch of int warm introductions that I was able to close a lot of business from. And so it was a combination of the way I became number one. If you, know, if you want to be in the top 10, you don't have to do all this. But to be number one, I had to outwork my competition. And I had to use as many different leverage points I could get to get there. And so Dave opened the door for about 75 appointments for me over my first six months. And let's say I closed even 10% of those. That's seven and a half more appointments that I closed or seven and a half more deals, which compared to my contemporaries was six or seven weeks worth of sales. Yeah. And I did it. And I did it on top of the fact that I was already closing four deals a week to their almost one. And I'm already four times in them. And so I just immediately just hit the ground. And then like anything, once I had my system down, then I, the referrals start coming in because I'm closing more deals. I'm creating more opportunity to be lucky and get right. referrals from customers. Right. Because now I have more hooks in the water. And so it was just a combat, you know, I reverse engineered what I wanted to do to be and what success meant to me. And I started to do that and I understood what it was going to take. And that's really, I mean, I wish I had a, a sexier answer than hard work, but besides relationship capital, which you either have going in or you don't, anyone who starts right now and jumps into that company or company at all, they can reverse engineer success. And I learned that from Kobe Bryant. Well, every, first of all, people. I would say everybody has relationship capital to some degree. Mm -hmm. uh, you were savvy about using yours. So right. Maybe you had more of it, but what you definitely did most of all was use what you had. And I see clearly a lot of people don't do that, but, and I, well, I that's, actually, that's, that's the number one, that's the, besides hard work, like, so I equate in sports, if we're going to use the sports analogies, which you did earlier, hard, hard work is defense, right? It shows up every day. Yeah, that's up to you. If you work hard, no one can stop you from working hard. You don't rely on anyone. Relationship capital is a conscious, dedicated effort 
to always be building relationship capital. And it's funny because I actually, my first book, which is coming out um, in the next two months is on relationship capital. And I have a course with LinkedIn where I, where they hired me to create a LinkedIn learning course on building, developing and leveraging relationship capital, because besides hard work, that's the secret that I've used to build all these companies, which we'll get into with Everbull mm -hmm. and how I've used that relationship capital to grow. And not enough people understand exactly what you just said. Everybody has it. They're just not maximizing it, leveraging it, nursing it, building it and developing it. Yeah. And, and people say, well, you know, oh, you just lucked out. I mean, your mentor was David Meltzer. And I, I know Dave, I actually had David on the show a week ago. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I was on his, um, his Friday trainings that he does, uh, I guess, three or four weeks ago. We've gotten to, to know each other and um, great guy. He wasn't, I, I'm trying to do the timeline. He wasn't still, he was at he, Sports One when, when you were talking. No, about God, he, he, was, he was in high school. Uh, oh, our, moms, oh, okay. our moms are best friends. Um, and okay, I grew gotcha. up watching him play high school football and he used to come watch me play little league. So like, yes, I got lucky to know Dave Meltzer when I was a little kid and he was a, a kid, right. but I was with him before he was anybody. And he was with me before I was anybody. We were friends and, and then 14 years apart or 13 years apart, um, in age. And he took a liking to me because he, I mean, we were very kindred spirits as far as like how we do things. And then when he got into the workforce and started companies, I interned for him when I was 13, 14, 15, 16. So, you know, when he had global web video, which was, you know, I used to go to car dealerships and help convince them that they should put this moving car on the screen instead of a static image. You know, this is back in the nineties when the internet was, was new um, and are becoming more something that was actually being used. Um, and then, you know, when he worked at PCE phone and he was the CEO of a publicly traded company, I was there and interning. And so it was just like, all that. And then he uh, went to become the um, CEO of Lee Steinberg sports agency. Right. Right. And then naturally um, there was that. And then sports one is what him and Warren moon spun off afterwards. Um, and obviously by that point I was already doing my own thing. So I, we didn't work to like, we, I didn't work ever at sports one. He was, gotcha. that was uh, I was already an adult by then. Okay, cool, cool. So, well, anyways, I, I just, yeah, I mean, mentioned that it, I, um, you know, people say, Oh, well, you had, relationship capital that's lucky but I don't um, I'm just gonna throw out there that uh, I can think of a really really great way to build a lot of relationship capital and it's called start a podcast <laughs> yep. I, um, I now count Jeff Finster as part of my relationship capital and David Meltzer and uh, so far about a hundred other awesome people it's it's amazing I love I like that you said about it's playing offense it's being intentional it's mm -hmm. taking a certain concentrated amount of your schedule you know 168 hours in a week and saying I'm going to build ass intangible assets called relationships yes. that I'll and make deposits and make deposits yeah exactly not not try to make withdrawals out of the gate make deposits and they will uh, it, it may be um, a deferred dividend but eventually you'll see it and, it, and well it, let, let, let because I'm so passionate about this topic, I, I do want to hit on what you just said because great, I think great, it's yeah. so important. And if you're listening to this and, and you're sitting there going, yeah, that, that's cool, but I don't know anybody. People's biggest mistake is they pre-qualify relationships. Who, oh, where do you live? What do you do? Those are qualifying questions for us to decide how important we think this relationship is going to be to us. Right. And it's a big, big, big mistake. Um, because what everyone forgets is everybody has a mother, brother, sister, cousin, aunt, uh, uncle, nephew, niece, and that person could be the person you want. And I'll give you a great example. My biggest client, when I, so when I started my own payroll company, obviously I took a bunch of my ADP clients and we wanted to go bigger than that 50 employee and undersized scope. So we were trying to grow as an organization, get to that thousand employee company, 2000 employee company, right? But in order to get those, they want to know that you already have one. So it's chicken and egg, right? right? You need the big companies as validation that you can handle the big companies and big companies don't usually take chances on small companies that don't have any proof of, of concept right. or, or proven success. Well, at the time, you know, back then I was going to the local grocery store once a week and I made friends with the woman at the checkout counter. It was the same woman, you know, were we hanging out socially? No, but would I just go through the line and ignore her? No. Would she just run her items and ignore me? No. Like we became to the point where she knew I had a daughter. She knew I'd started my company. Oh, how's things going? How's the new business? Like we were in that cordial three to four minute conversation, two to three minute conversation every time. Right. And it got more than just about groceries or how, Oh, you having a good Thanksgiving. It was, it was personal. 
Well, fast forward, I started my payroll company. I'd been doing it for about almost a year. And she says, hey, you have a payroll company. My brother is looking for, they had a huge issue with payroll. He's looking for a new payroll company. Can I connect you? And I said, sure. Of course, I would love that. Thinking it was, you know, three employees, 10 employees. It was almost 2,000 employees. And we closed the deal and it became our largest client. And that wow. all stemmed from relationship capital that I built with somebody who had no perceived value to me. And the deposits I made on a weekly basis was, caring about her while she's stuck at her job and she's trying to, you know, pass the time in a productive, happy way. And I'm investing time to get to know her personally and let her get to know me and using that time. And that opens an opportunity. You can say, yeah, I got lucky that I got a 2000 employee company from it, but how many of those relationships do I have where I don't get that? And right. the luck becomes, I put more hooks in the water than most people. So I give myself the opportunity to get more lucky because that's all you're doing is putting hooks out there in life. And the people who get lucky put more hooks out there than everyone else. And anyone who's ever gone fishing knows a hook catches everything. So throw hooks in the water and things happen. And that's where opportunity presents itself. And as we go through any of the companies I've, I've, I've done or anything personally or professionally I do, you'll see a trend. The commonality is I like to throw a lot of hooks in the water. Yeah, well, and it stands to reason. I mean, it's, it's probably, like I said, goes without saying, but I, I think it's worth saying anyways, that like, you can't be um, too transactional about what you just described, where you're going through and you're sizing people up. And like you said, you know, is this a relationship worth having? Or, well, what's, you know, the next step would be, well, what's the likelihood that this is one degree of separation from a relationship worth having? Like, if you go through life, you know, a, a mentor of mine once said, if you're always keeping score, you're always going to be behind. That's right. Well said. And um, you can't, it's, it's that it, there's a level of just like genuine reciprocity and, and a, a belief in the universal law of, you know, give before you ask and, and what you put out eventually comes back to you. And yeah, I mean, there's probably a hundred of those people that you've invested in and it only takes one for it to quote, be worth it, but that's not why you were doing it. No, because I, again, the idea is to lead with value, but more importantly, the two rules to work at Everbull to tie it back to uh, what I, my current project and my two, two of my main five business principles in life are make friends and have fun. And those are the first two rules. Like if you come for a job at interview at Everbowl, we're going to tell you there's two rules to work here, make friends and have fun. If you ask me, what are the two principles I have in business and life is make friends and have fun. And it's, that's all it is. I'm just making friends with people. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely more interested in you and I want to get to know you and I don't care what you do. I don't care if you're the president of the, a major corporation or you're um, a lifeguard at the, local, at, the, at the local beach or you're a teacher or you're a doctor, or you're, it doesn't matter because I don't care what you do. I care about you, the person. And when you make that, that, that big shift mentally and you start looking at people as people and who cares what they do, you're going to start building relationships and you're going to create brand ambassadors and champions in the world. These people are like that, you know, that Jeff Lerner, he's super cool. He's a great guy. So Oh, I know he has a podcast. You know what? I'm friends with somebody who's probably a great fit to be on your podcast. And for all you know, it's somebody you've never heard of or it's somebody you've been trying to get on your show that, you, that you've had no luck yet doing. And now they make that warm introduction and now, boom, you're on there. You got that guest. And then that person goes in the world and, and you're creating these, these Jeff Lerner champions out in the real world because you're a good person. You care about other people and not what can they do for me, but what can I do for them? And that's, you know, a whole section of my course is on leading with value and, and being more, you know, be more interested in them than interesting and how you can develop that. And the greatest thing you can do is start making deposits initially, do something for somebody else, make an introduction, make yourself available, do those things. And it really starts to exponentially grow into this, this luck world that, that some people live in where opportunity right. just falls in their lap. And what you don't see is all that groundwork of, of how they've nurtured, developed, built, and now are leveraging that as opportunity. Be more interested than interesting. That's uh, yes. That's it. I mean, that's beautiful in a nutshell. So, so the other thing that um, that I caught from your your story about payroll, which I didn't realize the entire experience was only like what six or seven months, um, but that you know, it seems like for a lot of people. I mean, you described a dream, like what, what seems like probably even an un, that what many would consider to be an untouchable dream, like half a million dollars a year, playing golf, working, you know, doing quote, real work 15 hours a week, getting flexibility, getting to see your kid. 
And, and there's a lot of people that might say that you, 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 know, you cut off your nose despite your face to walk away from that over a $17,000 bonus that you were going to get. You just wanted it six months early. Um, and earned it six months early. Th that's right. You earned it six months early. And so, so I, I can see a lot of people going, well, you know, right there, you differentiate yourself. You know, that's not most people's reaction. Most people, when they, when they call their bluff, when ADP calls their bluff, they tuck their tail between their legs and they shuffle back to their desk and they, they learn their lesson from a good slap on the wrist and they never speak up again. Right. Um, I'm curious in, in hindsight, you know, you run a big business now, like companies do have policies. They do have fiscal years. They do have budgets. They do have to take from one place to put to another, even, even if it's six months early. I'm curious, in, in hindsight, do you think differently about that scenario or do you still think that they were, they were being jerks and they got what was coming? Well, I don't think they were being jerks. I, I totally appreciate company policy now and I do totally appreciate the, the requirement to have standardized process and you can't have customization for 10,000 people. I get all that. Where I think they still made a colossal error, which I would never do, and I've had sales teams and I made sure not to do it, is there's there's different kinds of work, right? So like there's binary work, which is just on, off, one, two, like it, it's accounting is a great example. There's nuance, but the rules are set. Mm -hmm. But then there's the artistic world, right? Like you can't tell a singer how to create that song or a painter how to paint that picture with rules. Like you've got to give them the freedom yeah. to do what they do if you want the result that you're asking them to create. Well, I feel like in sales, especially to not have a bonus structure that rewards like their, their excuse to me of, well, you're an outlier and, and most people don't achieve annual goals that early. Okay, that's cool. So if I'm an outlier, then create an outlier system that says, when you achieve this, you're getting it because I'll argue, are they sitting there saying, we lost that person for $17,000? Yeah. How much money was I going to generate for them for 17 grand? And the reason I felt that way is I felt like a prisoner. I had that moment where I, I literally almost hyperventilated. I'll never forget. Like I got the sweats. I saw my life in front of me and I'm like, I'm never, I can't do better than number one, right? Like I can't, it's not like, oh, if I do better then maybe though, like I already am doing as good as I can and company wide, I'm number one. If I can't move the needle here and I have to wait six months when I'm number one, how long do I have to wait when I'm number three or number 86? And so I just saw this whole future of myself trading arbitrary time where I can't control it. I can't do anything to change, but waiting like a prison sentence. Oh, I must wait six months for a bonus. Cool. Now I want that next upgrade in my career. Oh, it's, you have to be with the company for three and a half years before you're eligible. Well, I've only been with the company for nine months. So now I got to wait two and a half years before I'm eligible to move up. And that to me was so scary and such a, a, a fear that I was going to be a prisoner trapped in this lifestyle. And I just bought a house. I was engaged. I had a kid. So I had a mortgage, a daughter, a fiance, a wedding, and six figures in law school loans that I was still paying off. And all the excuses not to leave the high paying job. And let me tell you, my mom and dad were not stoked when I told them what my plan was. Right. Um, they didn't think I was making a wise decision, especially back then when starting your own business was not sexy. There was no social media to glorify the process or right, the people right. who've been successful. It was called business ownership. And what do I know about owning a business? I've been an adult for six months. Yeah. Um, you know, so there was so, and, and my dad would tell me I was being irresponsible. I had a daughter, you know, why I, I, I you know, you can't make those things. And, and I said to him, I want to teach my daughter, you don't settle in life. Like if you believe in something and you want to achieve greatness, go achieve it. I can always go get a job at another ADP. That's the other beauty. Like that's the argument that I give people that say, well, Jeff, you're crazy. You gave up all that money. You gave up all that. And I'm like, well, if, if, if it wasn't a fluke, you don't think paychecks will hire me? Right. You don't think a car dealership will hire? Like, I can't go get a good sales job? Of course I can. So my fallback plan was I'm employable. I'll go make, my, I'll go make someone money and they'll hire me. Um, so let me go chase my dream. Let me, let me show my kid because more importantly, when you have a kid, people say you can't do that with kids. I'll argue you have to do it when you have kids because otherwise you're putting false ceilings on your kid's future because you're, you're, you're leading by example to show, oh, you know what? You are limited. You can only do this. Take the slap on the wrist. Go back to your desk. Don't speak up. And now go work for 30 years and be a little bit miserable. And it's okay. Like that to me was just not going to happen.
So. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I have to say, from my vantage point, I, you know, my, my business, Entre Institute, we teach entrepreneurs. So, and, and some of them are established entrepreneurs, and some of them are people that are, they just want the life change that they perceive of being able to get out of a job and have a side hustle or, you know, pay bills a different way. And the number, I mean, the, the, I'd say the two biggest impediments that people have toward reaching their goals are either not having the support of their spouse, which usually is because of how their spouse was raised. So it's actually the same problem, just transplanted to a different person. Or it's the fact that they've spent decades of their own life with, an, with a false ceiling, like you said, self-imposed because of how they grew up. In other words, it was imposed on them by their parents. But then when they turned 18 and they had permission to lift it, they just, they just held on to it, right? Yep. And so whether it's, like, it's it, go ahead. No, it's like that picture. I don't know if you've seen, there's this picture of adult elephants in, in, in parts of the world and they have like a little rope tied to one foot yeah. with a small little pin in the ground. Right. That their sheer force could rip it out. But because as little elephant, baby elephants, yeah. they, were, they never could, they stopped thinking they can. And it's the same thing with gnats. Um, there's this science, uh, science thing that was done where they took those jumping gnats that can jump. Yeah. I guess an average gnat can jump, let's say, 10 feet. But if they put gnats in a, in a smaller jar, like a six-inch tall glass vase, and they put a lid on it, the baby gnats that are born in there will never jump higher than six inches, even though they can because they hit the ceiling once or twice. Therefore, they thought that ceiling's there no matter what new environment they're put in. And that's just the way things work. And that, knowing that, and us having the, the being, being humans and having the ability to understand that concept, if you have a child, in my opinion, I wanna show my children there is no ceilings. And I'll go and if I fail, I'll learn and I'll pick myself up and I'll keep going. And that's just part of it, but don't, don't have that self-imposed ceiling. That is so important. Yeah. And, um, you know, the other thing that I think bears mentioning in your story is if you're going to get good at something, get good at sales, because you could put Jeff Fenster in just about any English speaking country on earth. And maybe you're bilingual. I don't know it, but at least anywhere you can speak the language and somebody's going to hire you. Right. Um, it's a, it's the ultimate transferable skill. Um, so anyway, okay. So let's fast forward then. I want to make sure we, we talk about Everbowl and, and, yeah. And really, it's even more broadly, just the, the, the shift into starting businesses and being an entrepreneur, right? A huge amount of, of the audience here for Millionaire Secrets is either current or aspiring entrepreneurs. So I'm guessing that you learned pretty quickly that being the top salesperson for an established payroll company with decades of, of system and process maturity like ADP is very different from starting your own payroll company from scratch. With no yes. processes, right? So very different. You want to speak to the, the, the blank slate and how you filled it up? Sure. Uh, so I started it with a buddy of mine, a, a good one of my best friends. We started it together. Uh, I actually got him the job at ADP and then convinced him to quit and, and join me. And we started our own payroll company, iChecks. And we decided he was going to handle the operations. I was going to handle the sales. And back then, uh, this was 2008. So access to information was better than it was five years earlier when all you had was the Britannica encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, but it wasn't like today where you could basically learn how to build a nuclear bomb on in your pocket. Right, um, right. But we started researching and you started to see like, how do you process payroll? What do you do? You know, and, and listen, there's so many uh, learning curves along the way. And, and obviously I'm very much, I have a much clearer perspective on it because it was in the past and I'm much more experienced as an individual back then I didn't realize what we were shaping but we applied the five core values that I talked about I think all entrepreneurs entrepreneurs uh, start start entrepreneurs you name it any part of that spectrum you need to have and take an inventory of your core values because that's what you're going to lean on when all these unknowns happen right so your core values need to be what are you trying to accomplish on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis. And so really quickly, like my five, and I'll just name them just because I think it's important that important is make friends and have fun, as I already mentioned. Uh, number three is be remarkable. So if you're going to do something, you do it. Number four is do it now. And number five is Kaizen, get 1% better every day. And if I can do those five things at, uh, at any task, I'm going to be successful. I'm going to make friends and have fun. I'm going to, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it remarkably. I'm going to do it now. I'm not going to put it off. And I'm going to get 1% better at it every single day. And that exponentially keeps me ahead of, ahead of my competitors, make sure I'm growing and not plateauing and you get there. And so um, 
going from being an employee with all the processes handed to me and everything given to me to having this clean slate was like, holy smokes, what do we do? And let me tell you, we ran into some serious learning curves because I sold all those clients I just sold. I quickly got them over to our new company or the majority of them. So we had this big book of business right away without any clue how to process right, payroll. Right. I don't know how to do taxes. Like we, we even went and got a printer from Staples. If, uh, if you remember Staples, oh, yeah. um, we got a printer from Staples and we got check stock and we printed all these checks. And let's say we had, I don't know, a thousand total employees across all of our companies, our first payroll run. We give it to them. All of a sudden I get, we start getting phone calls. Hey, our checks aren't cashing. Our checks aren't cashing. Our checks aren't cashing. We're like, what? Why aren't the checks cashing? We, we got the software. We got the printer. Well, we came to find out of something that we were unaware of that banks use something called Micro Ink, M-I-C-R Ink, which has a magnetic residue in it. So you can't just print a check off your at-home printer <laughs> back then. Right. So literally we, we gave useless checks to all of our customers the very first payroll run. Like it was just, so now we're driving around redo. Like it was a, it was a hassle. And you want to piss people off, don't pay them on payday, right? Oh, yeah. That's the easiest way to piss somebody off. Um, and it was little stuff like that. You know, you learn. But once you learn about Micro Inc., we got 1% better today, right? We didn't, we didn't cry over spilled milk. We picked ourselves up and we figured out what we could do. And, and slowly but surely, you build this company. And that's how you do it. And um, the challenge for people who are listening to the show and watching and saying, well, it seems so easy or it seems so hard or you had it figured out like and I don't. Nobody has it figured out at that time. You don't get to talk about your, your story until after you've done it. So I have all of that experience that I'm speaking from. But when I started day one, I was exactly where your audience is right now, or a lot of your audience is right now, which is no clue, but just a pep in my step, a desire to get it done, and some understanding of my core values, which I didn't have articulated, but innately those what I was doing and focused on was micro goals on a daily basis. What do we need to accomplish today? Where are we going? Because I think entrepreneurs make the mistake of starting without knowing where you're going. And that's a mistake. Um, so we knew what we were building. I was building the next ADP. So reverse engineer that. Okay. We need this many clients. That's our goal. Okay. To do that. What's our 55 and two model. And we keep working backwards until we get to where we are right now. And then we know what our first step needs to be. We need to be able to process payroll. So Brian, my partner went off and started to figure out the operation side. I figured out sales processes, contracts, getting the documents, what I needed to get from customers, how we were going to get them, what was our unique selling proposition, what was our look going to be, our brand. You know, we called ourselves little i-checks because um, back then that was like the birth of the iPhone. And it was like, yeah, this little i thing's cute. So we stole that. And, and we kind of started continuing from there. And it was just gradual micro adjustments and improvements until uh, we got to the point that we thought we knew what we were doing and we realized we still didn't. And we kept going. So maybe you can speak to that a little bit more. Um, and and I'm, I, I think this is the same thing, probably, it's the, whether it's payroll or it's Everbowl, it's the same thing. I mean, you starting with the end in mind, right? This big vision. When you say, like, you're not just saying, well, I wanted to um, build a successful payroll company or I wanted to, you know, make a quarter million dollars a year and retire at 60 or, you know, whatever. Like you're saying, I want to build the next ADP. Yep. That's real big. Um, and then, you know, certainly with Everbowl, I mean, entering, you know, a, a very competitive industry that's really a, a crossover of multiple competitive industries, whether it's the, you know, organic whole foods industry or the fast casual, you know, quick serve dining industry. Like you, you, you know, you take on a lot, right? When you, when you do these things. And so you're starting with really, really big goals and working backwards from there. And that's, that's one of the Grant Cardone's principles of his 10 X rule, right? Is like, everybody reads the 10 X rule and think, and here's the part about, Oh, you need to work 10 times as hard and do 10 times as much. But the other part of the 10 X rule is you actually should start by thinking 10 times as big too. Well, you're yeah, doing you that. How do you, how did you naturally do that? Like the yeah, most conventional wisdom is to do the opposite and, you know, start small, manageable, eat the elephant one bite at a time, all that stuff. And don't, don't get too big for your britches. Right. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, well, again, I think that those are false ceilings because kids don't <laughs> think that way. Yeah. You can learn so much by, by children, honestly. Uh, kids make friends with every other kid. We don't judge. Kids just want to have fun. Kids don't have uh, limitations. They have imaginations, right? Every kid wants to be a princess, the next athlete, um, uh, an astronaut and go to the moon, you know, uh, you name it, whatever they're into, pick right. whatever interests the child. That's what they're, they're, they're thinking enormous. And um, if you aim for the stars and miss, you land on the moon. If you aim for the moon and miss, you land right back where you started. So 
you got to aim bigger. And even if you don't get there, what's the big deal, right? Like you, you, the beauty is there's so many elements and, and layers in between. And so, you know, what I learned about myself along my journey was just that I'm not a, there's different kinds of entrepreneurs now that we're dissecting that word and it's become more of a thing, you know, and, and I'm a serial entrepreneur in the sense that I don't do one thing. Like I've had, I've never been in an industry longer than four years. And I jumped from industry to industry to industry with zero experience because the experience creates ceilings. So when I started payroll, I didn't know what I was doing. When I started a recruiting agency, I didn't know what I was doing. When I started a digital marketing agency, I didn't know what I was doing. When I started some websites that failed, I didn't know what I was doing or a capital company or a restaurant chain or a construction company or a CPG or a manufacturer, which I have now, right? The reason I'm able to do that is because I come in with fresh eyes and disruption and don't have limitations. I never, I don't know anything about restaurants. Um, you know, after I sold my digital marketing agency in 2016, um, I didn't know what I was going to do. And my wife and kids, I was pretty much at home driving them nuts. And my wife said, go do something you're really passionate about. You're driving me nuts. <laughs> uh, you know, cause you're not sinking your yeah, teeth in yeah, anything. And so I said, okay, well, besides startups, which had been what I, you know, I started and, so, and sold and scaled and sold and sailed and uh, started and failed many companies prior to this. Um, I was like, well, I love health and wellness. And I think that people aren't their best version of themselves because we don't move our bodies and we don't eat real food. And when you look at America, we're killing ourselves with heart disease, stroke, obesity, cancer, diabetes. And the science is showing 80% of these are preventable or delayable with lifestyle change. Yeah. I'm like, okay, well, that's kind of like we know smoking is bad for you. And I'm a business guy. So I saw an opportunity and I said, well, um, why aren't we eating right? We know eating bad is bad for us. Why aren't we doing it? And then I realized we're making excuses. And why are, what are those excuses? And I came to conclude that the four excuses people make to eating unhealthy are they believe it costs too much to eat healthy. They don't think it tastes good. It doesn't leave them full and satisfied or they just can't get it. They're in a hurry and they need fast food. Right. So I was like, well, perfect. Why don't I start a quick surf chain that makes eating healthy, affordable, filling, delicious, and accessible? The birth of Everble and the birth of Unevolve, which is my why. And that's the lifestyle that I, it's a word I created and trademarked. It's on my shirt too, you can see. Yeah, yeah, um, and uh, it means to move and eat the way you were meant to, live actively, and eat stuff that's been around forever. Everbull's tagline is made from stuff that's been around forever. So Everbull's the eating component of the unevolved lifestyle. I'm promoting an unevolved lifestyle. I don't care about restaurants. I don't know about restaurants, but I started a restaurant chain to solve a problem. And that's really what it is. And, you know, when I said to my wife and kids and my parents, I remember in 2016, hey, I just signed a lease. I'm going to open a restaurant. My dad said nine out of 10 restaurants fail. And my mom said, you don't know anything about how to cook. You don't know how to cook. And my wife said, all you do in a kitchen is eat and make a mess. Like, are you sure a restaurant's the right choice for you? And I said, nine out of 10 restaurants fail because 99 out of 100 restaurants are started by restaurateurs, people right. with restaurant experience that have been in the restaurant industry for so long. So when I started Everbowl, not knowing anything about restaurants, I wasn't limited to do things the way 100 out of 100 other restaurants had done it. So I'm not subject to those statistics. I'm not using the same limitations or same rules. I'm coming in with fresh eyes. So what are we going to do? We're going to serve healthy food that's affordable, filling, delicious, and accessible. That was our goalposts. It was very clear. Yes, I want to build a national chain because if you're going to do something, and that's my third uh, core value of be remarkable, it doesn't help me to just be a local, simple right. one-store mom and pop. I want it to be remarkable. I mean, let's aim for the moon or the stars, and worst case, we'll land on the moon. And so it was, let's focus on those four caveats. And then the other thing that I've done with my companies that has allowed me to grow, scale, and exit companies is the concept of vertical integration, which I started with my payroll business. And so by vertically integrating this enterprise over the course of the last four years, it's built a moat around what we're doing and allows us to become the hottest or, or most talked about brand because of how fast we're growing. And the great example was the first restaurant cost me a quarter of a million dollars to build. It was expensive. And I was like, well, shit, I self-funded that. I want to self-fund them all. I don't want to keep spending a quarter of a million dollars every time I want to open a restaurant. I want to open a hundred of these. That's a lot of money. So first question is, how do I solve that problem? And most people's answer to that is go raise money. Yeah, and it, it is an answer and it works. And I've raised tons of money prior to Everboy. I'd raised about $15 million for different ventures. I don't want to raise money yet. I'm not in a position of strength. I'm in a position of need and you don't raise money from a position of need. So using my experience with Everboy, I said, okay, what if it just costs less to build restaurants? Why does it cost so much? I started researching. Why is it so expensive to build these things? Come to find out it's because construction companies have to make a profit. And there's, 
it's a, it's a unique skill set and it doesn't make sense. So I started my own construction company called We Build. We build stuff and we build all the Everbulls. And so we've built the, you know, we have 32 open right now and we built 31 of the 32 internally because I said, well, you know what? I'm going to take Abraham Lincoln's quote, I think it was him, that if I have five hours to cut down a cherry tree, I'm going to spend the first three hours sharpening my ax. Well, let me sharpen my, my craft here. To make healthy eating accessible, I have to open a lot of stores. In order to open a lot of stores, I either need to bring in a lot of capital or reduce the cost of entry. I chose reduce the cost of entry and vertically integrate the construction component. So, I did, so we did that and that allowed it to start scaling. Once we started scaling, we started to create buying power. And then I realized, well, how do I make more money? How do I get more customers? Same problem. I chose to look at it differently than most restaurateurs. Most restaurateurs immediately say, well, we got to bring in more butts in the seats. How do we get more customers? I'm like, we're getting adequate customers. What if we just make more profit off what they're already spending and we would just reduce our expenses? Well, how can we reduce our expenses? So we looked at it and we said, well, you know what? We import superfoods all over the world. I'm a startup guy. I'm good at starting companies. So we started our own import business to import our own superfoods so we could amortize the expense of those across our stores and pass the savings back to our, our, our profit line, so to speak, mm-hmm. and not charge our customers more for the food. So I made an investment into that side of the business. So we were able to do that. And now we brought our, our cogs down, our cost of goods sold, and we brought our CapEx requirement down and we were able to scale and make more profits. And then making more profits allows us to open more restaurants, which in turn keeps increasing both sides of that pendulum and that vertical integration arm. And I'm going quick just because we're on a podcast. Yeah, and yeah, I don't no, have I appreciate my it. normal time. But that allowed us to start really scaling. And now I answered two of the problems of my four excuses. Accessibility, it's cheaper. I can build more of them. And it costs too much. I don't have to charge you more for my superfoods because we're importing them and we don't have to make a profit. Right. The import company has to make a profit. They take the berries from, from Brazil, mark it up 20%, give it to me, and now I sell it to you. If I go down and import it, I don't have their buying power, so I don't have their markup, so it's now 15% less for me to go do it instead of 20. So it costs me 5% more than, than the import company, but I'm saving 15%. That 15% right. gets passed back to my profit line or to my customer, my choice. And now that starts to continue to build. Also, because we start importing all these products, we have flexibility. We were able to pivot. When COVID happened, I launched Later Bowls. Later Bowls was direct to consumer acai bowls, but because I control my own supply chain, I'm in position to do that when the rest of the market is, is handcuffed, right. right? And so that allowed us to, to pivot and be lucky. And then we were able to get on QVC, which allowed us to sell more product nationwide, and that continued to open that up. And because of those two levers, When we decided to franchise because of COVID, we only started franchising in March when COVID happened. Um, That vertically integrated wheel or that system that we built allowed us to become the best franchise option available because we build the stores for you, franchisee. We provide the food for you, franchisee. So you're going to pay less for your goods and you're going to pay less to build your store. All two things that most of my competitive franchisee, uh, franchisors out there who are running restaurant chains can't offer. Yeah. And so now your cost of entry to get into a franchise is half or, or two thirds less than what it would be for my competitor. And you still get the same business and the same profitability. So all of a sudden it's like, well, now let's have a conversation. Right. And then as that started to happen again, my background as a serial entrepreneur, I launched a financing arm to finance the franchisees because we're building the stores. We're providing you the food. We're providing you the training and the brand. So we're here to help you be successful. And we know if you're going to be successful or not. And if you're not, we can help you. We, we're, not, we're not just a bank. And so that is really those principles, again, all going back to my four problems I'm solving. If it didn't address those four, now I'm going to round back to your question. Sorry to take you on that wild tangent ride. But to eat the elephant one bite at a time, we did that. I just look at the elephant differently. Right. And I suggest entrepreneurs out there understand that the problem is not that you're not necessarily thinking big enough. I think the problem is you're not looking at it the, the right way. You're looking at it in the same granular focus everyone else is instead of saying the elephant has multiple sides. Sure. I'm eating it one bite at a time. You're starting at the head and I'm starting at the tail. That's the only difference. We're just coming at the problem differently. And uh, one exercise we do internally, and I recommend all entrepreneurs ask this question, whether or not you, it changes your output doesn't matter, which is when you have a problem, don't race to solve the problem. First, ask yourself, is solving this problem the right approach? Or if we do something else, does this problem disappear? Right. Does the problem no longer exist? Because sometimes you solve a problem that didn't need to be solved. 
You should have solved something else, right? I stopped buying milk because it goes bad after two days. Or is your fridge broken? Right. Right? Right, right, right. So, so it's just changing pers perspective. It's changing the way you're thinking about it. And no experience means I'm not thinking about it the same way as the entire industry. And that's why I truly, truly, truly believe experience is the most overrated prerequisite to start a company. And I prided myself going from industry to industry to industry with zero experience and scaling companies because I find it to be a strength. I find it to be an advantage that I have over my peers. Yes, I, they, they know things I don't, and they're going to have advantages in certain areas. But again, I have an iPhone. I mean, I have access to information in my pocket that all the people who are all the industry experts post about it, sell products, sell courses, sell books. Uh, they have YouTube videos. Like I can learn all that experience on my free time. What I bring to the table is I don't have blinders on. I don't have a, a false ceiling. I actually am. I have a blank canvas. Yeah. And I get to use my current business acumen, my current relationship capital and my current experience that I've created over, over my career and apply it to that blank canvas. And that seems to be working very well for me. And it is, and it's allowed me to disrupt. And that's why Everbowl has been able to grow and scale um, in the quick serve restaurant chain industry so quickly and so effectively. And now I have a moat. Like, even if I give you the roadmap, you can start today, right. but we're not stopping today. Right. So I'm years ahead of, of my competitors in what I'm doing. And by the time they catch up, if we continue to make friends and have fun, be remarkable, do it now and Kaizen and continue to get 1% better, you can't catch us. We're too far ahead. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm glad you took the long way in answering the question because you, you touched on 10 other things I would have asked you if you hadn't or that I might not have even thought to. So I'm, I'm grateful. That was a really wonderful articulation of vertical integration. And I'm going to suggest that was a, a push to think bigger because I think a lot of people, they may have this glimmer of a big vision and then immediately they see all the challenges Whereas what you're saying is the size of the, of the challenge, the size of the vision is actually creates a vacuum that can be filled with the opportunities needed to realize the vision. That's and right. those aren't just necessary evils to realize the vision. They're actually additional opportunities on the basis of the size of the vision. In your case, to own your own supply chain, which didn't just become this break even additional piece of work that you have to do, but it actually created a whole new opportunity that you frankly never even could have anticipated, which was a pivotability in, in light of current circumstances that, I mean, it's, it's, it's just so cool. And, and I have all these, my wheels are super, you know, spinning right now on my business and what we're doing in the way we're, I'm, I'm feeling super validated because we're kind of vertically integrating in our own way. And some of it's still under wraps and I can't like get all excited and talk about it, but I'm, I'm sitting here going, all right, all right, this is good. This is good. You know, we're, yeah, we're, I mean, we're, it, and, and when you think about that concept, like I, I learned it from others, right? I, I'm the king of learning from smart people. I like to be the dumbest guy in the room. And I looked at QSR, you know, who's the greatest at that in, in the food space is McDonald's. Of course. Right. Everyone thinks they own the land, but most people don't know. They're the largest toy manufacturer in the world for the happy meal. Huh? They have the largest chicken farms in the world from the chicken nuggets. Right. I didn't even mention burgers yet, which is what they're known for, right. right? But that's how they vertically integrated because when you start to do that, you've got control. They don't have issues that are outside of the scope of their business. And yes, those are, these are big grand plans. And, and most people who have smaller companies are like, yeah, but Jeff, that, how does that work on a smaller scale? I'm not opening a hundred of these. I'm trying to do, and there's just, there's exercises you can do. And obviously I'm happy to make, you know, anyone who wants to reach out to me later, um, I'm happy to, to, help and as we get deeper into it but it's such an important concept it creates more hooks that's what i keep talking about hooks in the water because you don't know as you're trolling your boat what's going to happen i didn't think about qvc and direct to consumer and selling online that was never in our cards and then march happened and COVID happened <laughs> and it was like well how would we do it well we have the product shopify is very easy to spin up a website we already have all the inventory we have a huge customer base of people who love our product. We have their information. Let's just see right. if they want to buy it in their house. So we started testing it. And that little test created an abundance of opportunity that got us on a QVC eventually through results. Had we never done that, that's not an option. If I was just a restaurant when COVID happened, I'm shut down. Yeah. That's what well, I am. Yeah. Well, so, uh, yeah. And, and, and this conversation has been so 
exhilarating. It's literally flown by and I can't believe I'm saying it. We're out, like out of time. It's, it's, uh, I didn't, I literally, until I looked at the clock, I wouldn't have guessed, but um, you said, okay, you're happy to, for anybody that wants to know more, come into your world, learn more, talk more about that exercise of how to expand their thinking. And um, that's a great time for me to say, how can people get to know you better and come into that world? Well, easy is social media, obviously, at Finster Jeff on Instagram or email me, jeff at everbull.com um, and or LinkedIn. I have a couple LinkedIn courses, one on relationship capital and one on making a buzz. I'll send you for free, so don't pay for it. It's my offer to your audience. Um, yeah, and, and as I said to you, my first two rules are make friends and have fun, and I really mean it. So um, I truly like to build relationships with as many people and quality people as I can. And you know, if anyone who's listening says, hey, I want to pick his brain or I want to bounce an idea or you have some information for me and can help me, uh, I'm not too shy to take it. Again, uh, please, smart people, reach out and tell me how I can do things better. And let's continue to expand everyone's relationship capital and apply it, leverage it, and everyone be their best version of, them, of themselves. Well, that's, that's wonderful and, and gracious, and I appreciate that. Um, and I will say, I, I, I started by saying I had this quick serve experience of my own as a franchisee. And what, everything you said about the, the, the benefits and the advantages you have as a franchisor because of this vertical integration model, I, it's, it's staring me in the face like, oh my gosh, that's all the stuff that my franchisor didn't have. And, and it all fell to me as the franchisee. I paid triple probably what I could have if they'd been a leaner and more integrated model. And, you know, I know that now, Heinz, you know, 2020 hindsight, sure. <laughs> but um, so, so awesome what you're doing, man. This has been amazing. I'm grateful you came on the show. I'm going to strongly encourage uh, my audience to go get into your world and become part of your audience. It's just amazing what you're doing. And um, yeah, I just, I don't have much more to say. I, I look forward to staying in touch. Maybe I, we can have you on the show again, but this has been great. Thanks for being a guest. Well, thank you for having me. It was truly an honor, as I said, and um, big fan of your show. So thank you again. And, and yes, I look forward to connecting with your audience if, if, if anyone wants to reach out. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you to everyone out there. You are the best part of Millionaire Secrets and why we do what we do every day. I'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.